Hi, everybody. Welcome to It May Interest You to Know. I'm Tony Marcolini. I'm joined today with my co-host, Marty Mangello and John Hartman, and a very, very special guest, Patricia Ward-Kelly. Welcome back. Um, as I said before in the intro, we are here today with Patricia Ward Kelly, um, trustee of uh, the Gene Kelly Trust, uh, president of Gene Kelly Legacy, wife of legendary Gene Kelly, uh, author, historian, biographer. Um, we are honored to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I was so happy that you reached out to find me. I always encourage people to do that. And and you did it, so hats off to you. Well, I'm a I'm a lifelong fan of your husband. I think I've seen most of his movies. My mom was a lifelong. My mom was a fan, so I was used to watching them from when I was young. I mean, you know, he made dancing look so easy that you know when I was a kid, I remember watching them and thinking I could, you know, do the same moves across the living room, which of course I can. I have absolutely no dancing ability. Two left feet. Uh, but he made you feel that. You know, he made you feel that uh, that joy and that ability because he made it look so easy. It's funny. He said that it was so hard to make it look so easy. So, wow. that was, but he really that was his intention to, to make it look effortless. And I think I think that's one of the great charms of it. And you saw that during this lockdown with COVID, everybody was. The minute it would rain, everybody grabbed an umbrella and yeah. they were out <laughs> imitating Gene out. And uh, there were three-year-olds, and there were 103-year-olds out doing it. So I think, I think that is. I think that's what really distinguishes him is that it does look simple. It looks like everybody can do it, and it's it's not. But it's not. Like said soon in the rain is just a simple Irish clog dance that anyone can do. <laughs> Well, that's my favorite. Actually, Singing in the Rain is my favorite of his films. <laughs> so, of course, you know, Debbie Reynolds, Don, Donald O'Connor uh, joined him in that. But uh, he, you know, did some pretty amazing numbers. I remember splashing around, too, in the water, thinking I could make it look that, like that. And, of course, I can't. Uh, did he take lessons from when he was young? He's, his mother sent him off to dance school when he was he was very young. and But he hated every minute of it. He... he uh, it, the posturing, the bending over and handing a rose to a girl. And he he just thought it was all for the birds. And, and the minute he would go, she would dress him up in little shorts and little stockings and polished shoes and uh, Buster Brown collars and Windsor ties. And the minute he came home, um, the boys were waiting on the corner and would just beat him to a pulp. And uh, so he said that the, the value of it was that he learned a very strong right. I mean, he learned to defend himself. He hated it. He didn't like to fight, but he had to. And and the mother, uh, Jean was going with his older brother then to these classes and neither of them liked it. And they begged to get out and she, mm -hmm. To avoid the boys on the corner, she started sending them on the streetcar, and but the boys would still wait for them. And then she actually started using her hard-earned money to send them on in a taxi, uh, but they, the the kids would find them regardless. And so he finally she relented and let him stop. And but then he got into high school, and he was small. He, was, he had skipped grades. He was such a brainiac. He had skipped the grades, and he he was so. Uh, adept at movement and dance and so charming and that he found out that the girls liked that and so he decided he would go back to dance school on his own and pick up as much as he could so it uh but he never envisioned being a dancer he never wanted to be a dancer he wanted to be shortstop for the pittsburgh pirates he wanted to be a hockey player he was a tremendous skater and used to play hockey on the Homewood Cemetery in Pittsburgh that had a, a pond, and he said they beat the bejesus out of each other, and 
And, uh, but there was no professional team in Pittsburgh at that time. And, and he said as a baseball player, he was superb as a, in the outfield. He was a superb, he could catch anything, but he was not good at hitting. He was a guy that they had to bunt over. So he figured that was not a, for and then he decided he wanted to be a priest. And then girls came along and kind of broke that up. And then, uh, then he wanted to be a lawyer, uh, at, like a couple of you, and uh, he, he actually enrolled, he enrolled in law school at the University of Pittsburgh, and and then he he really thought it was going. To, it was kind of like the priest. You know, he saw this guy out there, like I want to be that guy. He's the orator down there, and so he saw the law as Clarence Darrow. He thought it was going to be. Uh, this grand oratory, and then he found out it was really boring, torts and liens, and and so he ended up selling his books and going back and committing himself then to teaching dance, which um, ultimately uh, he he moved away from that, wanting to choreograph and head to New York. But but the law was kind of an interesting one. I I, I don't think that would have been a good fit for him in in retrospect. <laughs> and, and would have deprived the world of an amazing talent. <laughs> yes, they, as he said, they lost a great shortstop for the Pirates. But uh, and it's funny, I set out to be a lawyer as well. I went wow. to uh, undergraduate school determined to be a lawyer, and I was very good friends with the then head of the Denver Law School and. Uh, he said to me, he said, don't do it. He said, it's not for you. It's not creative. You won't like it. You won't. And so I, I changed course and headed into English and Melville scholarship and and then kind of took a U-turn and ended up with Jean. So it was kind of a wild, wild ride. Right. You were a contributing scholar, correct, to the, uh, to the Herman Melville um Project. I was in the uh, Northwestern Newberry authoritative texts, which are quite wonderful. Most people don't buy them. Uh, they're not they're not in every bookstore, but they're beautiful works because of the scholarship that's involved. And I always, uh, I, the work on that as uh, in the research was so helpful in the work that I do now because I said that the first day I arrived, the professor said to me, he said, never trust the printed word. And I always trusted, you pick up something, it's in print. I thought, well, it's got to be true. And and I realized very quickly that I, I figured if you pick up Moby Dick, it's Moby Dick. And then you find out, no, it's actually, there are multiple variations. And, and the same when you read, it may, really made me distrust the things particularly as I began to work with Jean, the written accounts of his life, and I realized none of it was very accurate. So I, I was taught to go to primary sources and, and to go do the real due diligence. And so it was very helpful because that's what I've done. Jean was very accurate in his accounts, I found, I think because he was wearing so many hats as director, choreographer, performer, but as a journalist, I felt it was, and historian, I felt it was necessary just to check that. So I would go to the Arthur Freed collection at USC and check the production notes, which literally account, they're two different accounts by two different people for every minute of every day. Wow. So it's very easy to dispel, well, it's, it's very easy to counter the mythology. Dispelling it is harder because people hang on to these myths, like that there's milk in the water and sing in the rain and things. And, um, but it shows, it shows exactly, it'll say uh, Gene Kelly uh, from 942 to 943 uh, changed pants due to, uh, tear in left cuff or something. I mean, it's, it's, it's very specific and I'm not kidding about that. It's a, it's a kind of record because it was a business. It was, it was businessmen who happened to like movies, but they had to keep track of every dollar and every, all the spending and everything. So. Now, I don't know if you'll consider it too private a moment, but uh, would you tell us the story of how you met Jean? It's not private. It's funny. It's um, I mean, it's a little hard to believe because you're you are describing how your mother loved Jean and you love Jean. And so <clears throat> I I uh, was in graduate school at the University of Virginia, thoroughly intending to go on to be a Melville 
specialist and I got hired by a film company in Washington DC to do a film about Melville and and then subsequent films about other American writers and and then they had a um, uh, I, then they had a 90 minute television special about the Smithsonian and they asked me to come on as a writer and then they fired the two writers and brought me on as a writer and I, originally it was to be Gregory Peck as the host narrator and I had seen The Kill a Mockingbird so I knew who that was but then they said wow, that sure. Gene, Gene Kelly was going to be the narrator I had no idea who that was I, I didn't know I honestly did not know the name and I did not know if it was a man. I didn't know if it was a woman. I, and I, they really were talking about this thing called singing in the rain. And I, I just didn't want to show my ignorance. So I just said, Oh yeah. Wow. And I played along and Jean, as, as you might agree, was just terribly, terribly handsome. And he was one of the most eligible bachelors of, in the world at the time. And so all the women uh, were literally on their phones. It was sponsored by Wang. It was in the early days when phones were about this big and they were calling their mothers to say that they were sure that they could get a marriage proposal out of him by the end of the week. And, and so the director who was a lovely guy who had started Masterpiece Theater and Zoom for television, decided that he would put me in the room to keep all of the other women away from Jean. And so it was this very whimsical meeting. I always describe it um, in my one woman show, I describe it that Jean looked at me like something had been tossed in his cage. I don't think he'd ever <laughs> seen anything quite like it. I, I had this long, thick brown hair parted in the middle of that 1980s style where you don't see anything but hair and a nose and wearing a man's lumber jacket and I had no makeup on and uh, high water corduroy pants and thick wool socks and clogs and, <laughs> and um, I looked like one of the New Yorker the Koran cartoons and uh, and he started off interrogating me questioning me with things uh, the first question was I bet it wasn't a question it was more of he said I bet you don't know the opening lines to Yeats' poem, The Lake Isle of Inishfi, and I did. And he went through this series of I bet you don't knows, and by the end of it, I was kind of like, well, who does this guy think he is? <laughs> I bet you don't know. And I spent the entire week working with him, having no clue of his celebrity. And we, we bonded over uh, words and language because his my pet study in graduate school was etymology. It was word origins and poetry, and those were his pet studies. So we just sat there and quoted poetry back and forth and played word games, and I just listened to him. And he had this language, this wonderful blending of Pittsburgh street kid and erudite gentleman of, <laughs> of slang and French and Italian uh, street language and latin phrases and poetry it was just and it was a it was almost a celebration it was a it was a luxuriating into language and not a showing off of language it was just just how beautiful words are and the sound of words and i so you're patricia you're familiar with the word yins yins yeah <laughs> And read up. Let's read up the house. Dan, downtown and uh, also uh, Warsh. Yeah. Go down and to the John Eagle. Interestingly, uh, when Gene first went to New York, uh, he was Catherine Cornell took him aside and said, oh, my dear, you must uh, meet with an elocution person to remove that accent. And so he did work with uh, her elocution woman. And when he went back to Pittsburgh, everybody thought he was putting on airs that they thought he was trying to be somebody else. And, and it was interesting when I first wow. came out to interview Gene after he asked me to come out to write his memoirs, I came out and I grew up in Fort Collins, Colorado, and I had a bit of a Western accent which Gene then proceeded to surgically remove with, uh, and with pronunciation of, uh, you know, we said orange, and Gene said Patricia. It's you're an educated woman. It is not an O R, as in, it is an orange. And so, 
I, I learned this language from him. And I think it's kind of funny because here he was a guy who had to have his extracted and I had mine extracted and, and it was, and then I went home and asked for a glass of orange juice. And you can imagine how that went over in the, in the Midwest. And, and the funny thing is now I live at 303 North Orange Drive. <laughs> so, so every time I order something online, everybody says, oh, you mean orange? <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I grew up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania area, Jersey, and um, so Baron de Kalb is very famous, you know, for fighting in the Revolutionary War. Um, but when I moved down here to Charlotte, we have a street here, uh, de Kalb Street. Now you can say de Kalb or de Kalb, de Kalb. but around here they say, you talking about de Kalb? <laughs> Decab, you go on down to decab, and then you take it all the way down to the hospital. I was like, decab, there's three three different pronunciations. So, well, uh, you can this, imagine my Kansas, my mother's from a Kansas farm family, and you can imagine me going there to ask about the rodeo um, because we lived on Rodeo Drive. <laughs> you know, there were no rodeos in uh, Kansas. <laughs> you go to the rodeo. <laughs> I had to get his. I had to go get his picture and put that up there because I I couldn't talk about him any longer without seeing that smiling face. Oh, and he, he's smiling right now. He's probably with us or sitting here. Or it's a great shot. It's really it really shows him. He uh, he's he just had a genuine. It was a beautiful face. It I, I've never really seen anything quite like it, honestly. And obviously I'm biased, but I have his mask uh, that was used by MGM for makeup and things. And I look at it and he's a, he's handsome, but it's not a rugged handsomeness. It's not like many of the actors of the day. There's a real beauty, I think, in his face. Oh, um, do you mind if I let my dog go? She's oh, please. Please do. Open. She's trying to open a closed door. Let me see if that our, works. Our last guest, uh, by the way, we never got a real big chance, did we, gang, to meet Arnold Palmer? Oh, wow. yeah. You we, what? We had a, we had a uh, <laughs> our last guest had a dog named Arnold Palmer. So oh, the picture and we, we kept Tommy saying, John. "Put Arnold Palmer on." Picture what? Tommy John has a dog that he that he named Arnold Palmer. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. I was thinking. I thought, wait a minute, because. You know, my dad wanted me to be a professional golfer and wow. start that early on. I wish I had done that. I would have, you know, I could have paid my rent, but instead I ended up marrying a legend. It's, I should have, I guess I probably, if I'd wanted to make a living, I probably should have stayed as a golfer, but I, I think I, I think this is okay. <laughs> well, your, husband, your husband was a big sports fan, like Pittsburgh, right? Loved, I loved Pittsburgh, the Steelers, the, um, he was, he always rooted for the underdogs. So uh, if it was, he didn't like the rich, uh, I mean, didn't like the rich uh, uh, sports teams like Dallas Cowboys and things like that. He was always- uh, oh, Man, didn't like the Cowboys. He, he kind of liked the underdogs. So he'd root for the guys uh, that were, he liked the common man and he liked the, he didn't like the really wealthy groups, so. So like on Sunday during football season, did you know that those three hours you could not bother him? He had to be watching the Steelers. Monday, well, no, well Monday night football basically. Okay. He just would be glued to it and and baseball. And it was interesting when I first came out here to meet with him before he had even asked me to write his memoir. He told me to come out to talk about some things, and I came out, and it happened to be the pre precursor of the World Series. So the the on every night. And so I didn't know, I didn't know if we'd be going out to dinner. I didn't know what we were gonna be doing. Well, what I found out is that I was boiling hot dogs, weenies, I was boiling hot dogs with yellow American mustard and, uh, and, and we were sitting in front of the television watching baseball. And Gene is meanwhile describing the connection between classical ballet and baseball and the movements. and. It was this incredible education and the same, he thought there was nothing more beautiful than a forward pass. Uh, I mean, he saw in all of the movements of the sports, uh, the, the elements of dance. And in fact, in the 1958 uh, special that he did, Dancing a Man's Game, he brought in all of the top 
people in their field. So he had Mickey Mantle, he had Johnny Unitas, uh, he had Vic Satius, um, he had Sugar Ray Robinson, and they all came in and what he was, it's called Dancing a Man's Game, and he's trying to show that the movements in dance are the same movements in these sports that people, guys watch and think are okay, and yet they see a dancer, a guy dancing, and it was not okay. And so he had, you know, Mickey Mantle do something, and each person was to do one of their select moves, and then Gene took each piece and created a dance and performed it. So, wow. but you know, it's what's so interesting, that's 1958 for Omnibus. You'd think we would have ended that discussion by now about it being inelegant for a man to dance. We're still talking about that. Why, why is that still a subject now? He had hoped to crush it back then, but it, it still pops up remarkably so. But, but I don't think most people, even to this day, think about the deep connection between Gene's movement and sports. And after he died, I found a, a folder in his drawer that he, he would cut stuff out of the newspapers and it was always out of the sports pages. And so it might be the basketball players leaping up, but you you can see each one is a dance move. And, and so, and he loved it when the sports writers would say, so Gretzky came in and it was a Gene Kelly or something. I mean, he loved it because he was often referred to the sports writers here, particularly in LA would write and a certain slide would be a Gene move or something. So yeah, he was, his whole style of dance is shaped around sports because he looked around and he wanted to create a particularly American style of dance, but there was no model. Well, how does a man move? Uh, and so the only way he knew how to do it was to, he looked to sports. And so if you look at his style of dance, it's very broad, open strokes and very low to the ground. It's a kind of brought down and that's, you see hockey, that wide, broad movement in hockey and, and baseball and things. So, and gymnastics, obviously he was a trained gymnast. He was a trained acrobat. He could walk a tightrope. He was any form of movement he basically liked, except the only thing he didn't want to do is play golf. That was not his. Not enough yeah. moving. <laughs> yeah, that, that uh -huh. just, exactly. That just bored him to tears. He said, why am I going to swing him and that's it chase this little white ball around. So uh, that was not his thing. That was a stairs thing, but not Gene's thing. Did, did he have a favorite uh, movie of his own of that he had done? Well, he, uh, people always asked him that and he would usually say it was on the town because it broke new ground oh. with being shot on location with the numbers there. That And that really was, uh, it was a very big, Thing for the French uh, New Wave, the Nouvelle Vague, that the French directors began to use that uh, format that Jean had used when they're all in New York City shooting all over. But then to me, he said, you know, but I really liked Three Musketeers. He loved the kind of daring do and the his his childhood hero, one of them was Douglas Fairbanks Sr. And so you get to see him with all the swashbuckling and, and the leaping over things and the, and the whimsy, the, the humor that he had, that kind of, you know, that kind of twinkle in his eye and that nod of his head and everything that you see. And so it's, I love, I love Three Musketeers, but I, re he really liked, I think, certain number, he never liked to watch his own movies. He hated it. I made him do it, but he always saw things he could do better, but he liked certain numbers. He was very proud of the roller skating number. He thought that was the best song he ever put over. He was proud of Heather on the Hill, the Pas de Deux with Sid Charisse and Brigadoon, American Paris Ballet, things. So he had select things. And those are things I've then taken and put in my one woman show and in my symphonic show or some of the, they're his favorites, but also my favorites. And they, and they show the diversity of his choreography. I mean, he and the diversity of his dance. So you see a Spanish number, a, a, a gymnastics number, a um, tap number, a ballet number. He, he really could could execute and create the breadth of, of every work. Now, he, he did a few, those, you mentioned On the Town. There were a couple of movies, I think Anchors Away, On the Town, maybe a third one. I, the name escapes me if, if there was one. 
Uh, but with the young Frank Sinatra, right, who did not know how to dance when he was uh, thrust into the movies with uh, with Gene. What was that like, having to teach Frank Sinatra to dance? He said it was great. Um, yeah. As he said, uh, I mean, they were dear friends. They were really, as Gene said, they were closer than brothers and had great respect for each other and really were friends to the end of Gene's life. Frank ha helped me a lot at the end of Gene's life. And the... Uh, Gene said that he trained like a prize fighter. He really uh, got dug in there. He was he was going to do it. And I think uh, the only thing that Gene's, Gene said it was very easy because he had taught so many young kids how to dance. That was what he did before he went to Broadway. He was a dance mm -hmm. teacher. So he knew how to teach people who didn't know how to dance. And he basically used the same skills and translated that to Debbie Reynolds and Don, uh, Frank Sinatra and Olivia Newton-John and 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 as he always said, you choreograph to the non-dancer. So you, mm. you choreograph to people. You all read these accounts that are totally <laughs> inaccurate. <laughs> that you, um, it's the security team has just gone out. The doorbell just <laughs> uh, that that you choreograph to the the other person to make them shine. Sometimes I'll read that Gene tried to outshine everybody. That was never the case. He made, he wanted every, he knew that you look better by the people you're surrounded by. So that if you, it, so you don't take away from them, you make them mm -hmm. look, and that only elevates you. So uh, that's really a life lesson, I think, for a lot of people working on teams, just in leadership or business. Um, when we come back from a commercial break, I want to ask you about your White House visit and what you thought of our food. Um, as you know, I was a White House chef. I was there in 1994 when you were our guest. And I'd like to get your opinion uh, on our cookery. Well, we are back again. And I promised the audience that when we come back, I was going to ask um, Patricia about her meal at the White House. Uh, we were very lucky to serve her in 1994 while I was there under the Clinton presidency. And Patricia, um, how did it go? And please tell us, of course, all about, I know why you were there, but for our worldwide audience on six continents, if you would share um, the illustrious occasion. And he really wants you to say how good his cooking was. Exactly. Well, was <clears throat> and we she know choked we on a fish bone. <laughs> and we know we won't get that to that right away because he's dying for that. But, uh, <laughs> but no, it was really, it was, I have to say, it was such a stunning experience to be at the White House. I, I mean, um, Gene and I had been there before as for the Kennedy Center Awards and things. So, and it was always uh, quite, we were there under the uh, George Bush Sr. for that. And, and then I got to come back when, uh, President Clinton presented Gene with the National Medal of Arts. And Gene was really proud to receive that and particularly to receive it from Bill Clinton. Uh, I think that was the right president at the time to, to present that to him. And Gene was not able to go. He had had his stroke and so he was still in the hospital. So I went and was able to accept that. And it was an amazing, quite an amazing array of people. Uh, Celia Cruz received it, uh, David Brubeck, um, Tebow, the artist. Uh, it was <clears throat> just this Julie Harris. I mean, you kind of walk into this ethereal group of people. And But I must say the dinner was, was really wonderful in the presentation. I, I love the table settings and everything. And and I had uh, James Fallows, the editor from The Atlantic, seated on my right, one of the writers. And, and I remember the bagpipes coming in. And it, it just was absolutely thrilling. And the, the one thing that really stood out for me, I must say, was the finger bowls <laughs> that, that were at the table, which I, I, I think James Fallows and I were the only two who really knew what they were and what you were to do with them. And the others were just about to drink them. And we, we kind of cautioned that that wasn't what you were supposed to do and that it was just a beautiful way to cleanse your 
fingers. And so that was that was kind of a great memory of of, of that. But it was, I don't know, there it's it's just such a special evening it's just so beautiful and beautiful in every way and every uh every element from the 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 dishes that are chosen and everything the the literal physical dish but then each of the what you had on the menu and i imagine i i didn't have time during your break to dash to the archives to grab my file on the event but i imagine if there if you did you would you have printed a, a menu or would you have printed would there have been yes. i recall there so been the, the menu place. each of them is is written by a calligrapher and some of those events will start months ahead of time to to write enough of them it may take that long so yeah it, Do you so want to I, have the whole menu again? Is would you like to have it? Oh, I would love to have it. And I, if there was anything on the table, I, I'm sure that I grabbed it. Um, if there was my name card uh, and my, I, I'm sure it's in the archive. I just didn't have a chance to scout what was in there. And I did not do the gauche thing though of turning the picking up the china and turning it over to check to see what it was. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I was dying to, of course. I mean, you want to see. I mean, this is. I really believe in that kind of. I, I love dinner parties and setting dinner tables and things. It's kind of I collect antique china and crystal and silver, and I just think it's it's there's something there's an elegance and a kind of important thing about dining that I think is really lost now. I think now the fast food notion is. We've, we're missing something because to have multiple courses and conversation and uh, it's it's a very different and I don't it's like Perlman was there and he played um, that that during that weekend or that and Clinton spoke obviously that night mm -hmm. and um, it was just those are those things that you just kind of I, I mean I was by myself which was really it was it was kind of odd because I was kind of the odd man out. Uh, everybody else was um, Harry Belafonte was there with his then wife. Everybody was sort of with somebody, and I remember that we had to come in, and as we entered to go into the receiving line, the the musicians, the White House musicians, played whatever music was. You could tell who was coming through. So of course. Take Five came on as Dave Brubeck came through and Harry Belafonte was this Calypso and Celia Cruz, you know, you can imagine what that was. Well, guess what it was for Gene? <laughs> you know? So here I'm standing there with this guard next to me. You, you were given little cards that said what your table was and whether you were sure. uh, like 1A or something, if you were where you were supposed to go. And I had this incredible... Uh, tall man in a uniform and he said he said to me he said ma'am I, I suppose people have told you this before but that's a beautiful dress <laughs> i just was like thank you sir <laughs> and so uh -huh. we're standing in the rain place and i just like i lost it and, and i come around the corner and there's president clinton standing there with with mrs clinton next to him and i just had to kind of pull it together and go up to him. And and as you know, President Clinton is known for shaking hands and, and you are sure you are the only person in the room. There's nobody else there. He's only talking to you. Everybody else has vanished because any, and I remember shaking the hand and it was so long. I kept thinking, um, isn't it, shouldn't we like break this off? <laughs> you know? And then he said to me, he said, um that's a beautiful dress and i was I, and it's this blue gown uh, oscar de la renta gown velvet gown and everything so it was kind of but i had just i mean this is really going off topic but <clears throat> i had we were staying at the hay adams and i had gone in to uh, i had started after gene got sick in order to stay at the hospital with him all the time i had just cut my hair i, I had long hair and i just cut it off really short and I had gone in right before to this, going off to Washington for this event. And I had um, gone into this new woman and she took a man's razor and she just sheared my hair like a man's 
cut. I mean, it was really, and it wasn't quite what I wanted, but it was what I had. And and there <laughs> I was going to Washington. And I remember coming out the door of the Hay Adams Hotel, and I had on this Oscar de la Renta that was like a, it looked like I belonged in a castle. It had a very low cowl neck, but then a high neck here, and these gorgeous amulet arms of, of in, um, embroidered, beaded. I'm standing there, and this man walks in with a woman. He looks very elegant. He's dressed very well, so is she, very pointed. And he looked at me, he said, did you actually pay someone to do that to your hair? Oh. <laughs> and you're just, oh. you know, you just kind of go, oh. And, oh, ouch. And uh, yeah, and and I have been trying, there was some confusion in getting the car for me. Somehow I got kind of off the list and every car would pull up and they'd say, I'd, I would stand there waiting and they'd say, oh no, this is for Mr. and Mrs. Harry Belafonte. And then they'd be like, no, no, this is from Mrs. Uh, Celia Cruz. And then pretty soon I'm, I just kind of went, um, and Eric Hawkins, the dancer, choreographer, and his wife got in a car and I, I said, they said, you know, you better just get in and come with us because I really didn't know if they were gonna send a car. And so I thought I better get over to the White House. And, but I mean, these are those things that you just can't believe, you know, and then you're, you're in the White House and you're with the president. And, and, and I have to say, as we, as we went around the room in, in the White House, uh, uh, the, Rosa Parks was there too. It was, it was, you know, these, you can't write this stuff. And, no. and I, I'm looking at, of course, President Clinton, just the, the room just is illuminated by him. But the one who was the most scintillating to me was Mrs. Clinton. Um, she, she was just so spot on and that's when i just i sat up and went whoa this is this woman is spectacular so um, she sure is yeah I, I used to kid around with them and and stuff and people wanted to kill me when i would go out there um for talking too much they said you definitely have too much to say but they would call me out there into the dining room in their house um up at camp david uh aspen their private home wow. and just chat you up and talk and you may be standing out there five, 10, 15 minutes talking and, and I would make jokes and stuff, which would infuriate admirals and secret service people. And, you know, they just were very, very nice. But one night I did tell them, uh, um, yeah, definitely you don't want to piss off two attorneys who are law professors. And, and Bill says, what's that supposed to mean, Marty? Maybe tonight is going to be the night you get fired. I was like, well, sir, I mean, you know, if I'm going to make a special salad dressing for mama, you don't call her mama. I was like, then I'm gonna make one for Papa. So I made a mango dressing for, for Hillary and I made a banana vinaigrette dressing for Bill, which was both of their favorite fruits. But you know, you have to be smart when you're dealing with law professors, but, but Hillary is very well spoken and has been a fist fighter all her life, um, all the way back to college when she oh, yeah. first started rallies to get tampon dispensers put into the ladies' restrooms which was, you know, people were like, this is outrageous, it's sickening, it's disgusting, this yeah. woman's gonna go, you know, all types of stuff. So the, the battles today are, are old hat really to Hill. And I still have, have been donating to her, I think I've been a donor um, for her fund forever, forever. I'm a monthly donor. I think about her a lot in a sense of <clears throat> when you, you know, if, if you if you have sort of slings and arrows that come at you and and they do and uh, especially I think if you're a young woman who marries a celebrity uh, the the it tends to be in the tabloids I was always the one who was the the wolf in sheep's clothing I remember that was one of my headlines and uh, and I, I never I wasn't prepared for any of that I didn't I I didn't know this world. I didn't know how cruel this world could be and everything. And I, so I use her as kind of an example because I think how on earth does she even get up in the morning? Because if she took all of this to heart, you could never, you would never wake up. You'd never get out of bed. And so she's actually been a real, she doesn't know it, but she's been a real model for me in terms of 
just having to keep going on with what is important, stay focused on the goal and don't get distracted by by all the many people who want to take you down for whatever reason. And yeah. and boy, she's just she's just gets it right and left. And and for being a bright woman, I mean that's what's so amazing is that it's but but in that room, I, I saw her acknowledge uh shake hands with Rosa Parks, Rosa Parks family and everything. And she knew exactly, she did, she'd done her homework for the room. She knew who everybody was. She, she, she knew exactly what to say and was really, it, it was a phenomenal experience. I, I'll, I'll never, I'll never forget it. And that meal, I can't tell you that meal was just out of this You finally world. got it out of her, Marty. There you go. Okay, okay. You happy. I can't <laughs> wait to. I can't wait to, and I'll share it with James Fallows, <clears throat> because I, yeah. But the finger bowl stood out because. Um, oh, I know who was there at my table. Lillian Vernon was there, um, and you remember the catalogs of Lillian Vernon. Yeah, uh, of course. Oh my gosh. My dad would always order stuff from Lillian Vernon, and here I am with Lillian Vernon, who came to about <laughs> here on me. And she she thought I was single, so she kept trying to set me up with her son, who was at my table. And I kept going, no, 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 I'm I'm married. And but he, I, well, and I shouldn't say, it, but but the, he was one who needed a little help with what that finger bowl was. So well, we were laughing earlier, right, when I said Nikita Khrushchev picked his up and was drinking out of it. So to avoid embarrassment, Jackie Kennedy picked hers up and started drinking out of it. And so then many other people at the table did. Yeah. It's always hard when you're not at a, well, you're, you're always trained. You watch the host or host, you watch the hostess and watch when what she does and when she moves and what fork she picks up. And so you, but when you're at a table like that, it's a little, you're on a little on your own because there's no hostess there. So you, and I, I was, I, I was, not not the closest to the dais. I was a little bit away from that, but you obviously couldn't see what they were doing. But it's not quite as strict as the royals. I did have uh, dinner at, with at Windsor Castle with Prince Charles, and wow, and boy, that's a um, that's one that that you know you, you have to really follow the protocol on that one. Um, and I hadn't gotten my my protocol instructions came to my house, I was in, in Europe and they came, I missed them. So I didn't get any of the instructions, <laughs> like the things, but I knew them that you're not supposed to look the royals in the eyes. You're not supposed to speak to them first. You're not supposed to do anything. And, and so I, I, I did okay on that. And, and, but you know, that when the minute they stand up, you, you whether you're finished with your meal or not, you, you get up and walk out. Yeah. So. Well, Prince Charles was such a cool guy, too. Um, uh, since I was in the Navy 30 years, I'm going to give him a plug. He was a big Navy man. Um, not a lot of people know that he was in combat actions during World War II um, in the Mediterranean and several large battles. They've never heard these things. And at, at the White House one night, um, a couple of our butlers went in and, and Solomon said, uh, oh, excuse me, sir, um, your majesty, may we get you a drink? And he said, no, 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 no. I'll have a drink, but only if I can make it. And it's going to be martinis shaken. So they were like, we, well, we could never do that. You know, your highness, please. Um, he's like, no, that was part of the deal, man. That was part of the deal. I make them, I shake them. So he was over there doing all that, you know, and, and, and pouring them and wow. he was just having such a fun time. Yeah. Just a, a, a wonderful guy. Well, speaking of Navy men, Gene was a Lieutenant JG in the Navy, and he and oh my, my gosh. father was an ensign in the Navy. Uh, wow. He was young. My dad was born in 1925, and Gene was born in 1912. So my, so Gene, uh, Gene's father-in-law was younger than he was. <laughs> but amazing. But they. Amazing. Uh, my dad was on a destroyer escort and Gene was, he was based in at the uh, Naval Photographic Unit in Anacostia, Maryland. And oh, yeah. he made a lot of the training films, uh, one called Irritability, um, about a thing that we now call PTSD. And wow. Gene shot about the wonderful films about um, the, 
the bomb plastic, the things that they would use in, in, in battle, and and actually his time in the Navy, it was because he was shooting, he was working in the Brooklyn Navy Yard about the ship that that made its limped its way home. So he knew all the people at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and that was why he could shoot on the town at the Brooklyn Navy Yard because he knew them. So he got permission. Nobody else could do that. And and that was one of the reasons why On the mm -hmm. Town was so revolutionary because the final sequence uh, that you, you have to run it again, but when you watch it again, the battleship is there at the dock and, and they're all saying goodbye and everything. And when they shot that scene, uh, Gene was down as director and his co-director, Stanley Don, was up on the boom with the camera operator and it was cloudy. And at that time, the instruction was, and it was literally, you got you technicolor people on a technicolor film, they would send a technicolor expert on, on each shoot and you had to abide by the technicolor uh, parameters mm. and they guided everything and never technicolor hadn't been shot in in low light like that in and, and so the camera operator said it's a no-go we can't do it and she knew that that ship was going to pull out that you don't call the ship to come back for a retake that he had one opportunity for that ship to leave the harbor and so Jane just went like this it signaled it to go ahead and the camera operator took the clapperboard, the black and white clapperboard, and turned it upside down, which is a signal to say, I'm shooting this under protest. I I, oh. I know this will not turn out, but I'm so I'm letting you know I know this. And they shot it and Gene said he came home to he and Stanley Donnan came back to California and they thought they had nothing in the can. And mm. it turned out it was beautiful. And that then uh, it enabled them to shoot Technicolor in, in many, many different situations after that point. So it's kind of an interesting thing. But also, while Gene was in New York, he ran around and that's when he figured out he could shoot on location because he scouted all the different places. And, you know, they just grabbed, they didn't have permits, they just grabbed shots and and they'd stuff Frank Sinatra. They had a yellow cab instead of limousines to transport Frank because Frank was the hottest thing in the world at the time. So they would grab Frank, stuff him on the floor of the cab, race to the location, pull him out. Gene had a little stopwatch in him and they'd count out the beats and they'd do their number, stuff Frank back in the bottom of the cab and race to the next place. And so it's a, uh, you know, it's pretty fun. You do see in the shot with Rockefeller Center, people have begun to realize Frank Sinatra's on the loose in New York City and they're gathering there over this skating rink area but it uh, it's again 1950 1949 wow. it's it's 1949 when that came out uh, yeah it's these things are over 70 years old and they hold up you know this is um uh, and they julie mentioned they here they are up at the top of um the the tall buildings in new york and julie munchen had was afraid of heights so they had to put a rope around his legs so that because he was petrified as they were going to the edge to look over and everything. So they're, you know, it's just guys on the town and, and grabbing stuff. Now, can you imagine a film crew now, a Hollywood film crew? Nothing would happen like that. They'd have eight cameras and four million extras and dog bone makers. And, uh, you know, it'd be, it, it, it's a different business now. For certain. I mean, he danced with, uh, I want to say, Judy Garland, um, Fred Astaire. I mean, all the greats. Uh, did he tell you anything interesting about, you know, some of the uh, the people he danced with that you'd like to share with us? Well, he loved Judy Garland and he really credited her with teaching him how to appear in front of the camera. He had no clue. And the director uh, for Gene's first movie was For Me and My Gal. Um, in 1942 and Jean had was used to dance performing on a stage which is very different from the camera and so J Judy just they kind of grabbed him by the neck and s told him what to do and how to sit in a chair and how to kiss on camera and everything and 
And so he always gave her a lot of credit. He loved her. And he thought it's interesting because when you read the the contemporary accounts of her, she literally is described as an ugly duckling. And Jean thought she was not only the brightest person in Hollywood, he always also thought she was the sexiest woman in Hollywood. And they did the ended up doing the three pictures together and were set to do Easter Parade together. And then Jean's friend accidentally broke Jean's ankle in a backyard oh. volleyball game. So that brought Fred Astaire out of retirement to dance to Jean's choreography in Easter Parade that changed the trajectory of Fred Astaire's career to, to go on to do things like bandwagon and it really changed his choreography. So he was influenced by Jean. Jean was not influenced by Fred, which is an interesting. People don't know that. Wow, that is interesting. Um, he broke his ankle. I, I wasn't even aware of that. Did that hinder? I mean, I assume he, he obviously recovered. He still went on to a career. But what was that like? I mean, anybody who has an injury knows afterwards you're never quite the same and you're... Well, as he said, he always said dance is a masochistic sport and you dance hurt. Uh, he danced with torn hamstrings. He danced with sprained ankles. He danced mm. with um, torn ligaments. Um, he... In the there's a number with Mitzi Gaynor and Jean in uh, in Lay Girls that is danced to Cole Porter's Why Am I So Gone About You. They're both injured. She had a sprained ankle and he had a, a torn hamstring, and you can you can't see it. And uh, and he said to Mitzi, he said, "Do you want to stop and wait and recover?" And she said, "No, no, let's go on. You go on." And I think if you talk to any dancer, they're, they're mostly dancing injured and trying to just protect their bodies. But Jean always said it's this great, the great, the thing that's the great irony about dance is that by the time you really begin to understand your instrument, your instrument is already in decline. Uh, and so, especially for men, you, you would really peak at a very early age and then it's just kind of, uh, I think dancers are dancing longer now than they did before, but um, he said, of course, if you play the violin, you can play till you're 101, but but he bowed out of dance. He said, when I could no longer jump over the tables, I, I, I bowed out because I didn't, he wanted people to remember him a, as able to do that, not as somebody that you kind of go, oh, you know, he didn't quite make that. And, but he had, he skied in Switzerland and he tore his knee out in Zermatt and he ran a ski pole through his thigh in uh, Closters and he wasn't supposed to be doing any of this stuff, but those both, those injuries took it down. He, he was often in, um, the, what's it called when you're, you're, you're to stretch your back out, you're kind of in a- Physical therapy or, or traction. Yeah, traction, he was in traction a lot for his back and his back was just kind of these shreds and shards of things but uh so yeah the the broken ankle was just one of many broken things and broken torn things <laughs> if there's one number he does uh that i include in my show it's a terrible movie called living in a big way about the post-war housing for veterans gene and olivia de havilland were on the committee to try to provide housing for people and uh, and this was a movie kind of dedicated to that, and it's on the building site. And Jean has a sprained ankle, torn ligaments, I think, in that one actually. And and you can't imagine it with what he's doing and bending that and 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 smiling and everything. So, and that reminds me, this is a little off point, but you're kind of talking about these people and what they stood for. And one of the things I wrote last year for the Chicago Tribune was a piece about Jean and the anti-lynching law. And Jean was one of the signers in 1947, along with people like uh, Albert Einstein, to try to get a law to prevent lynching. And talk about deja vu. I mean, we're, we're still talking about that. And it was, and people are still denying that we need a law to prevent lynching and lynching still happening. It's, it's, it's just kind of mind boggling, but I found I found all these documents and all these people and and Jean's work in the 1947 efforts for that. And it was, you know, he was always, he was, again, it was the underdog. It was always trying to fight for that, the other guy who might not have a chance. So I, 
I was thinking of, I know Roseanne Cash is working on the, the lynching, trying to prevent lynching. And I thought I'd reach out to her and maybe see if we could join forces and do something with that. I don't know. It's Very. Seems like kind of a no brainer, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, really. You would think. Um... And it is well, a Franklin, Franklin, it was in the 30s, actually, and Franklin Roosevelt it would have become law, but Franklin Roosevelt opposed it, so the anti-lynching legislation. Well, Roosevelt, and that, it was Eisenhower, too, who, um, and they, they didn't want the mess of it in the, uh, so it was, and it was, that was the White House that, that prevented it, and everybody's gathering outside of the White House, everybody's in Washington marching, and and they decided it didn't didn't look good for, for the White House. Yeah, so. it, it was kind of weird too. You know, when they would go up to Hyde Park and stuff, they had separate areas for the blacks to eat in our servants, you know, behind the scenes. Um, they were not allowed to sit with each other or mingle with each other. Um, just the butlers and the waiters and the chefs, they had to go eat in their room. Same thing at the White House. Uh, um, both him and her, some people have tried to blame Eleanor and was like, no, 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 this was the rule for mommy and daddy. So it's kind of weird to to hear about that, to read about that, but it is the truth. Yeah. As great of a president as he was. Well, and in Hollywood, um, you had an actor like Sidney Poitier who could not enter the same, even on a film shoot, couldn't enter the same stay in the same hotels as the rest of the crews when director Richard Brooks was shooting and Richard Brooks said, no, 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 we will not stay in separate places. And so it's certain people, I think, who stand up for those things. But anyway, I I don't know. I, I, I found the list of all the people who signed it and then I, I found all of the errors to that. So I thought if we could get all the errors to the signers together to try to do something i don't know <laughs> that was that was in my spare time last year when, and now i have a new ballet jean's ballet from, wow. from uh, cool. that he premiered in 1960 at the paris opera it was the first time ever that a, an american-born choreographer had premiered at the palais garnier and the first time ever for jazz music and we're remounting that with scottish ballet on september 23rd in glasgow uh so i'm flying oh, man. To, Scotland awesome. to do that and it, it should be spectacular. It's to Gershwin's Concerto in F and so that'll be an exciting thing to get out and the first thing for everybody to see since COVID and for the performers after 18 months. So, And you're still writing his biography, am I correct? You're still going to continue with that project? Oh, yeah. No, it's all around me here. Um, uh, but I, uh, I actually thought that I would be devoting, you know, certainly January to now on the, it's more of a memoir than a s straight biography, but uh, but then the head of the Scottish Ballet reached out to me and he decided that he wanted to move forward with the ballet. Originally had it positioned in 2024, but he thought it would be a good one to open the season after everybody's, people are yearning for that kind of joy, I think. And they had Meyerling set and that's a pretty dark story. So he decided to put this in. And so I kind of, set the book aside temporarily and focused on that and it's really interesting i was going through jeans Jean would handwrite his choreography on a score and then go in and translate it to the dancers and the score i have with all his handwritten notes which are very hard to read but it's it's such a wonderful assemblage of not only did he have the language facility of french italian and everything but in dance he has it and so you see things like i mean this is just an example of um these are the things he's written knee you yugoslav kick to pas de bourre over the foot pirouette bourrees pique alton step from his mentor and broadway john alton swing low or sway like the Charleston beat. Um, so you've got this and he's got s Jewish wedding and then he's got things like jazz walk, bent corkscrew, fuetes. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's classical ballet terminology mixed with t uh, tap terminology mixed with Lindy Hop terminology and jitterbug and there's a tango in here. And, and he, so he could just from one bar to the next move from a 
classical move to a, a contemporary jazz move. And it's a, it's a pretty exciting piece. So if you all want to come to Scotland, come on over. Where can people get information about this? Scottish Ballet just put it on their website uh, today and tickets just- Oh, wow. Available. So it's, uh, yes. So if they go to Scottish Ballet, they can see the descriptions and the some of the backstory and how this all kind of came into being. And uh, so, and there will also be filming it. So it will be a film in addition to the, because we didn't, we weren't sure if the theaters would open. So we decided to go and film it in, in addition. So. Um, so go to Scottish Ballet. I, I post all the time on Facebook at Gene Kelly The Legacy and on Instagram at Gene Kelly Legacy. So I, I will start posting about it now that we've been holding off because we didn't know if quarantine was in place or what was going to happen. So. Yeah. Well, so they're just finally coming out strong now. So that's really good. John well, is very quiet over here. He I'm just taking it all in. I'm really enjoying it. Okay. All right. We just didn't want to leave you out. I want to you tell, why, tell you your food is fantastic. I love your food too. Um, no, I actually <laughs> enjoyed, enjoyed your book. I was glad I got it. I had to, it, whenever Gene and I went to parties, he'd say, oh Christ, I've got to pimp the party to find out who was going to be there and everything. And and so I felt like, well, I had to pimp the party and find out if, you know, I read that you read it, wrote a book. So I thought, well, I better get this book. Miss Kelly, your pimp hand is very strong for <laughs> <laughs> But September 23rd, uh, if we're from New Jersey, it's Bruce Springsteen's birthday, just so you know. Oh, there you go. So, well, we'll have a little competition going on, but <laughs> I think we'll fill the house in Glasgow and, and then it's going it's supposed to go on a tour. It'll go to Aberdeen and Inverness and, Edinburgh and ultimately. Oh man! I, my, Can I say a question about the memoirs? Um, are those going to be given to a university one day, or the the written? Your your you said your um you have paperwork there at your house. Uh, oh, your I have everything here. I mean, I that's what I inherited from Gene is his archives and the mythology yeah. is that everything burned up in his house fire and. His house did burn in 1983. It was a faulty uh, Christmas fault on a dry branch and it took the house. The house was one of the original farmhouses on Rodeo Drive when it was literally a bridle path. The horses used to come down the middle of Rodeo Drive. And it, so it was a very unassuming kind of wooden uh, house with, and he had red shutters. It was very charming. It looked more like a Connecticut uh, cottage. <clears throat> and it was like a tinderbox. It just went up very quickly. But his papers and photographs and things were in a back room. And wow. so many are smoked. Oh. Even, even this, uh, his Gershwin score is smoked around the edges, but it's saved. But to your question, uh, it's a bit of, it's all, I finally kind of decided after I looked and scoped out all of the different collections and universities and different places where things can be deposited, uh, there's a real problem with a lot of things because people donate materials and then they just basically get lost. I mean, they just are never seen again. They're never cataloged. They're never... Um, they're never curated. They're never brought out for display and to become parts of new and exhilarating exhibits. And yeah, well, you know, you know the story. And so I, since I think Jane entrusted me with it because I had the archival experience. So I started, I put everything in archival sleeves. I'm trying to get a database as best as I can. The technology changes so quickly. And I, I kind of decided that what I was going to do, because I thought uh, the dance companies all come here to my house. Uh, I have the archives here. I can't I don't have a sofa here. I can't sit. This is the only chair that I, nobody else can sit here. I have this chair. And then behind that door, it's 85 filing cabinets. There's there are three drawer, 36 inch, uh, a five drawer, 36 inch filing cabinets. So you can only go single file through my house. And the dogs, it's so funny because they can't turn around. So they just jump over each other and, and I can't turn around and uh, and so ultimately I thought that, but the companies come here. So Matthew Bourne's company comes, the Australian ballet was here with 80 people. I had 50 people from, 
from the Royal uh, Royal Ballet. Um, and I don't, I haven't finished my kitchen yet. So I only have, I don't have an oven. So I cook everything in a toaster oven, which is hilarious. So I have these toast, famous toaster oven dinners that I cook for 50 people and you can do it. I mean, the French do it all. Well, you know, you don't need a big fancy kitchen like these Beverly Hills kitchens to do. I cooked something. on submarines for years and it's amazing. Sometimes I'll go into the 2%. You know, they call me, will you come and help us create Downton Abbey, Marty, and everything at the White House and how to do it. And we fired four people already and we're afraid with another household manager, it's becoming chaos for the children. They don't know who the next nanny is. And a lot of times it's like uh, the Von Trapp family, you know, you got to go through a couple of governesses to, to get the one you want. But, um, you know, they'll they'll show me the kitchen and, and one of our clients said, I want to rip it all out, Marty, and gut it and do a brand new $3 million one for my wife. And I was like, well, this is a pretty awesome kitchen already. I mean, it's got the everything. Uh, this is like at least $2 million in here right now. He's like, well, just, you know, let's let's just and then don't throw the stuff away. Sell the tile and, and sell the equipment. But I wanted to, you know, I told her $3 million. I So, you know, we got to do it. I was like. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll sell everything or donate it. Uh, would you take a donation letter for the food bank for these, you know, Vulcan ovens that are basically brand new and, and the Sub-Zero and, oh, sure. Yeah, I don't care. You know, if you want to donate it, I'm like, all right, OK, well, we'll do the donation letter. So it, um, it's yeah. A very, yeah, it's an interesting thing because a friend of mine described it, said most of the kitchens look like the, the slabs of marble that you should be doing autopsies on instead of preparing a, a dinner. And I, mean, I literally have a toaster oven and I have a hot plate. I have a little uh, Japanese hot plate and the, all these young people come in and they think there's going to be a staff and there's going to be a you know one of those big old kitchens and they come in and they look at it and they're like, and it, and you can do everything. I mean, I just take one salmon out and I put another salmon in and I do five course meals and you just don't need all this stuff that they, that they buy and that they, the trappings of it, but it's, so it's quite funny, but the archives to answer your question, John. So I, people, the young people come here and they see this stuff and they're really blown away. I mean, it's an emotional experience for a lot of them because they see Gene's handwriting, they see his Converse tennis shoes, they see his hats, and and I and I don't want to put all that stuff in a place that nobody will be able to access. So my idea, if I live long enough and if I can generate enough money somewhere down the line, which is not my strong suit, um, is to create a, a virtual archive and that it would go up and, and be available in perpetuity. And that basically anybody who wants to access it and get in and explore it and get inside Gene's head, they'll hear him talking about something and uh, they'll hear his voice and, and they'll be able to read his letters and they'll be able to see his transcripts and things. And and if it's a boy, it's if it's a little boy who's interested in baseball, but he hates dance, he's gonna be able to click in and hear Gene's comments about baseball and why it's the connection and things. So that's my dream, but it's it's incredibly expensive to do. And again, the technology changes. I met with the IT people at USC several years ago and they've already changed these immersion experiences. So, wow. so I think, you know, I, the goal is now I've had the one woman show, I have a big, the big live symphony show that is a live symphony playing to Gene's clips uh, and then I'm on stage weaving the stories on that and that's ready that that's going back out again next year and then now the ballet and then I hope to finish the memoir and then I have two books that will come after that that are kind of companions to the memoir of, of uh, the beautiful photographs done by people like Stieglitz and Eisenstein and Robert Kappa and um, Bob Willoughby and and I want those done beautifully on beautiful paper and then and then I want a, a record of his objects the objet that the little things like Converse tennis shoes the things that people get to see in the house that they'll never get to see someplace else so and then 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 comes the archive I <laughs> I guess that'll that'll launch and I just I just have to pedal really fast because um I mean, I I'll, I'm 62 and a half now, and and uh, 
I feel like I, I've just got to keep moving pretty fast, keep all these things going. Well, you're doing a wonderful job for his legacy. Um, it's wonderful. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I mean, it's a historical important figure. So, what's well, yeah, a privilege? Are generations of scholars going to be thanking you for this. Well, the thing is, you know, it's funny because it, as I say, it really is a privilege, and um, I'm I feel very privileged that he entrusted me with it because. I think he knew intrinsically that I would, I mean, he was very specific that how he wanted to be remembered and to get this out and everything. I think he knew I would do that. And I, and I based, I promised him that I would that way. And I think too, the thing is, you know, if he were not a decent guy, if he were not, I couldn't do it. I mean, if he were, there were a lot of those Hollywood guys that were not, A, they weren't that bright. They weren't that nice. They weren't that, they certainly weren't renaissance men there weren't you didn't spot a lot of those and and the man of such integrity a really deep integrity and humility i i think all those characteristics it's you feel you're you're proud to present that as opposed to kind of like mm, yeah i know that about him or so there's there's no and it's, italian you said yeah, I spoke a, because the Italians on the street, uh, it was this polyglot group uh, af, at the time growing up in the Depression era and everything. And so they taught him all the games, the, the games with uh, marbles and the games, um, uh, hand game, that game. And I'm just, what's it called? It starts with Watch. an M. It starts with an M. Um, it, you throw your hand a certain way. Um, anyway. They taught him all this stuff. And so I, I, I remember when I went to Patsy's in New York, I don't know if any of you've been to Patsy's. Sure. Yeah. Patsy's was where Gene always went uh, and Frank Sinatra too. And and I started going there after Gene died. We were supposed to go when he was alive, but he got sick. And so I started going there and there's a great Italian waiter there. And he used to speak Italian with Gene and would prepare the help prepare the special food that Gene wanted and everything but yeah it, it was it was fun Gene was very interesting in that he was very respectful of other making an effort now you hear people they don't want to learn another person's language they think that person should learn their language or and Gene always if we visited some country or spoke to some official from another country, he always knew at least enough to have a, a conversation. And I, I remember uh, it was particularly evident to me when um, Havel came from uh, abroad and uh, Jane had me go out to the bookstore to get all of his writings and he read everything before they met wow. and then uh, but then he spoke to him and um, in Czech, and it was, uh, and it. I just think I think that again is another kind of lost art that you. It's you're honoring the person you're meeting, so you, you. If it's a French person, you're you. It's entre and things. So I, yeah, I le I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot of lessons. It was. I mean, in some degree, it was kind of. My Fair Lady, it was a lot of wow. kind of, I mean, he, Pygmalion, I was Galatea, I guess, in the sense of learning uh, how to, ex how to go to the White House, how to, how to go to Windsor Castle, how to, how to go to any event and feel comfortable, I guess. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, I know we're out of time, but I do hope that you will come back because I feel like there was such a breadth of material to get through. There were so many movies that we still wanted to talk about, but it's just impossible to get through it in one session with you. Well, I would I would gladly join up with you anytime. So just reach out and uh, and I'm delighted to know about this culinary archive. I, I want to explore that a little bit more. And if you do have any, I'll let you know what I have here in the, re the my records and we'll share our records a bit from that night, certainly. Perfect. Well, thank, thank you, you. We are going to schedule you to come back uh, because Great. as I said, we, we still have so many movies that we really wanted to get your spin on and we wanted to talk about. We thank you. It was a privilege uh, to have you here and to have a conversation with you. Thank you for the work you're doing. A true, you're, you're a film historian and uh, 
you know, I, I think to be able to pick your brain uh, just for the hour that we've been talking to you, it's it's been a pleasure and an honor. Well, thank, thank you. you. And and please, John, it's Patricia. So as, if we're going to carry on this, okay. carry on this conversation, we, we'll go. But and and what fun. I, I mean, I love it. That's the problem is I kind of stray off and I. It's, That's what it makes it fun. That's what makes you fun. And then you go, oops, I didn't even, oh, I didn't answer that question or anything. <laughs> but but I'm, I'm happy and we can we can go into all kinds of stuff. I'm going to dig in because I bet I have, I may have some of the stuff from the, um, you were only there in the Clinton time, right? Not under, not under the Bush. Oh, oh I think we lost Marty's audio. I think we lost your Sorry audio. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. I say this is six presidents now that I've worked with, um, but the actual cooking every day in the house was only with the Clintons every single day. So, wow. Yeah. Okay. But would you have been there for the Kennedy Center honors and things in the past? I'll send you, I'll let you know what yes. they were. Yes. Yep. The 93 to 96. Yeah. Okay. That would have been, okay. Yeah. So we, I'll have to look at when we went for that. We went in 91, definitely for the Kennedy Center honors and things. So, uh, and um, I'm hopeful that you enjoy haggis and get a good cockaliki soup yeah. while you're in Scotland. <laughs> Uh, yep. I teach Scottish cookery and the classes and do all the authentic stuff. And we are uh, a watch Outlander on, on television with stars all the time, <laughs> religiously. So <laughs> we're both Scottish, my wife and I part Scottish. So uh, when you come back, um, maybe we can get some permission to roll some of the footage, uh, maybe just a clip, and we'll oh. hear all about your adventure uh, overseas. That'd be awesome. Uh, great. Okay. We'll see what, yeah, Scottish Ballet is very good about documenting things and probably will have, I know they're documenting all the rehearsals and things. I'm going in on Zoom calls to watch the rehearsals. And so they're, they're, they're definitely documenting the process. And there are be beautiful photographs of Jean from the 1960s, the, those glorious black and white photos of that elegant, you know, the things that you just, Oh, what a what yes, is so these are the photos actually from the website. Tickets are open, so please, folks, um, if you want to to read more, uh, you know, check out the photos and see all the information. Oh, there he is rehearsing, uh, and I'll be there on the first night, the twenty third, and I'll also be there on the second night. The second cast will be on the twenty fourth, so I'll be there two nights, and I'll be there all. As I said, I'm doing my one woman show in Inverness at Eden Court on September 5th, and they should put that up for sale pretty soon too. And so I'll have a month of, of Scotland, which I don't mind one bit. I love it. There. Oh man, I'm so jealous. <laughs> yeah. We have friends going over there for a week and I've been to Scotland so many times. I don't actually know. It pisses my wife off. She's like, well, I'm sure you know, like how many times I'm like, I don't actually know. Like, well, why don't you to... surprise her with a surprise <laughs> yeah. trip to Glasgow? Why don't you just buy her a ticket, fly I to Glasgow, would love to. come for the opening of our ballet, and it will be spectacular, starstruck, and and she'll be she'll just fall head over heels for you again. You know? I would flip out at any opportunity to cook for any future event. If you have a gala event or a fundraiser or anything. My wife and I have raised as much as $567,000 in one night at a dinner for cystic wow. fibrosis. So uh, this is what we do. But yeah, uh, but folks. The real question tickets. is, how do you do with a, uh, a, um, a toaster oven and a hot plate? <laughs> yeah, no, we, we get the venue, the country club or wherever it's going to be held and, and let them do all the cooking. Oh, I don't do any of that fancy stuff. I just do the, I just do the, you, you, you will die when you see the arrangement. I mean, it is, it is, I really should have, everybody said you should do a television show uh, and it would have been perfect to be, if she hadn't taken the Barefoot Contessa, I would, because Jean used to call me the Duquesa. So I could have ah. been the, the Duquesa, but now we've got, we, uh, she's already taken that, but people would crack up if they saw how I make these meals and what happens and the the fiascos of how one person gets 55 people with yeah. a seated dinner. It's seated. I set the table. See, that's a cooking show in itself because yes. this is all how Jordan Belfort from the Wolf of Wall Street when he was in prison was sitting there 
and and telling you know uh um cheech marin like you know since you're in prison we actually have a vegetarian cooking club so you should come and cook with us and he started cooking and everything and they heard all his stories and told him you got to make a movie about all this crazy the wolf on wall street this is like unbelievable so he did he made a movie but it started with cooking and and just cooking in prison so well jordan belfort the wolf of wall street was his cellmate I don't mind the cooking part. I'll skip the prison part, but uh, okay. <laughs> all right, guys. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Just, Take care now. Reach out to me. I, I would love to. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks, so, I will. Thank You're you. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye.